I could talk about this stuff indefinitely, but I'm sure everybody doesn't want to hear all the nuances. Um, so uh, this is about income taxes for worker co-ops. So uh, one of the issues with working with worker co-ops is that uh, there are so many different kinds of tax treatments. So the first roughly half of this goes through the different kinds of tax returns you might have as a worker co-op. So, you know, uh, th three of the four basic choices won't really apply uh, to many of you, but uh, we will go through them at least uh, briefly. And then we'll talk a little bit about the new PPP uh, program the, uh, and the employee retention credit, uh, the two federal programs, uh, which at least uh, some worker co-ops are, uh, are able to qualify for. And then we'll talk about uh, some of the income taxes uh, as they affect you as an owner of your worker co-op and how you might report some of the things that uh, would come from your worker co-op. So this is really only about income taxes today. Uh, there are all kinds of other taxes you might have uh, you know, for your worker co-op, probably the most important of the, the ones on this list are your payroll taxes, if you have any employees or if uh, you're a co-op corporation, likely you all uh, are considered to be employees of your worker co-op. So you would have um, the potential for all of, all of these different kinds of taxes. Almost everybody uses a payroll service now. Uh, so it's generally a good idea to do that unless you have a lot of expertise with payroll. There's a, a lot of complications and uh, the penalties for payroll tax errors are uh, about as big as any kind of tax out there. So you certainly want to use somebody who knows uh, what they're doing for that. And as I mentioned, the first thing you have to know about your co-op or the co-op that you're consulting with or working with is what kind of a co-op they are. Uh, the classic cooperative is a co-op corporation, which is subchapter T. And the the T is a, a section of the Internal Revenue Code. So there's about five sections of the Internal Revenue Code that are specifically for co-ops. <clears throat> and that's really uh, all that subchapter T means is referring to the Internal Revenue Code. You might be a partnership and that's the default for an LLC or uh, most LCAs, but not all. Uh, so that's where you have pass-through taxation to the owners. And then the other two are less common, so I'll spend a little bit less time on them, but I will mention them because there are some out there. Um, S-corporations uh, can be worker co-ops. Um, my, my experience is that in co-op conversions, a lot of businesses are S-corporations now, and they uh, terminate that S status and then uh, opt to be taxed as cooperative corporations. And then the last one is tax exempt. Um, and it's important to note that although co-ops are often called not-for-profit or non-profit, most of the time they are not actually tax-exempt organizations. Uh, to be tax-exempt, you have to apply to the IRS for some sort of 501 status. 501c3 is the classic uh, uh, public charity. Uh, and then there's other sorts of associations and, and, and so on. But if you haven't actually applied to the IRS, then you're not really a tax exempt and you wouldn't file the, the form for that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. <clears throat> so if you are a cooperative corporation or if you are considering becoming one, uh, we'll go through the basic rules quickly. Uh, the primary one is that your tax form will be an 1120C. Uh, that is a variation. The, the plain 1120 form is a regular corporation form. That, that would be what, uh, you know, <clears throat> all of the large publicly traded companies you can think of are probably filing 1120s. So this is a variation on that. And then for most states, and if your city has a tax return, you're using the regular corporation form for that because none of the states have their own separate co-op form. Uh, your tax return is due three and a half months after your year end. So if you're calendar year, that's April 15th. And you can extend that out uh, for six months after your year end. Uh, so that goes all the way out to October 15th. Uh, so you file uh, from the first uh, year that you are incorporated or formed, uh, even if you didn't do any business. Um, this varies a little bit by state, some states, uh, are uh, very uh, 
conscientious about following up. If you um, incorporate it in, for instance, California or New York, they definitely expect you to file a tax return for that first year, even if you did not do anything. Um, other states are less, uh, uh, watch that less closely, and the IRS certainly doesn't either. If you had no activity and you were incorporated in a state, especially one that doesn't have a state tax return for a co-op, uh, which includes Wisconsin and Texas and South Dakota and a few other states, um, you wouldn't need to file until you actually have economic activity. Um, but for most, most co-ops, you generally want to consider filing that first year. Another thing to remember with a co-op corporation is you can choose a year other than December. Uh, the general idea on choosing a year end is you want to pick a time where the month or two after that are a little slower so that you can wrap up your year and get all your filings and things like that done. Uh, there are a fair number of co-ops that are June year ends um, and then some that are scattered around other year ends, but most everybody is December. It's easier to think about. It's the same tax year as your personal tax return. Um, and one nice thing about uh, corporations is that if you uh, don't have any tax due, there's not actually a late penalty. If you do have tax due, then the penalty is keyed to the amount of tax you owe. Um, this is a, a nice advantage of a co-op corporation because uh, many co-ops will um, at some point in their life uh, have a problem uh, with the deadline. And so it's nice if you don't have that, that issue. Whoops. Um, and then just if you are filling out a checklist and it asks you what you are and co-op is not an option, then you are a C corporation. Uh, what's down at the bottom of this slide here. Um, that is the, the generic uh, form that a co-op corporation is. And uh, uh, so you could just mark C corporation and you will be good. <clears throat> so co-op corporations pay tax at the co-op level, but they also have the option to allocate patronage dividends so that the members pay the tax. Um, this is different than uh, the partnerships and S corporations, which don't have any choice. Uh, and so in your co-op corporation, you can uh, decide who's going to pay the tax in any given year. Uh, you know, depending on your patronage allocation formula, you may or may not have choice for 100% of the tax moved to your members, uh, but you can at least move some of it. And then just so you know, for your planning purposes, if the co-op hangs on to money and pays tax on it. The federal tax rate now is a uh, flat 21%. And the states vary uh, anywhere from 0% to 10%. And then some states and cities have other minimum taxes. There are taxes based on uh, the net worth of, of a business or the amount of assets, uh, equipment or, or buildings or, or something like that, that they own. Um, so you might end up paying you know, as much as 30% of whatever the co-op keeps uh, for profit as tax. And that's something to plan out in advance, whether you're going to uh, have the co-op keep that or not. <clears throat> and uh, an advantage, one reason people choose uh, this form of the co-op corporation is because it can hold on to uh, unallocated or permanent reserves. And so that helps uh, uh, guarantee the future of the co-op that, that you have some amount of reserves that people aren't going to take with them when they leave the co-op. So, um, and you can't really do that in the, uh, the partnership or S corporation type. So this is planning and one reason that people end up choosing co-op corporations is because they, is because they want to have reserves. So if you have a qualified patronage dividend, which is pretty much what everybody does in a worker co-op, that means that the co-op gets to deduct it. So if you're a accrual basis, you can actually wait until well after your year end. So if you're a December year end, you could wait until summer following your year and decide on your patronage amount and deduct it back in that previous year. So it actually gives you a lot of flexibility that really no other uh, uh, business form is allowed. You can't do that with a partnership. You can't do that with an S corporation. Um, it's not a huge tax advantage, but it, it is an advantage. If you're cash basis, uh, you really uh, need to do that patronage dividend within the year that you earn the income because you're not really allowed to carry over from year to year. Uh, that's one reason I generally recommend that co-ops strongly consider a cruel basis uh, so that they can take advantage of that patronage dividend rule. 
Um, and it, it's important just to reiterate, the member has the income in the year they get the patronage dividend. So if, if you had a profit in 2020 for your co-op, your accrual basis, you can decide to uh, allocate that profit uh, to your members in 2021, and that's when they'll pay the tax on it. So they won't really file a tax return with that income on it until next year, 2022. So a few things about patronage dividends. Hopefully when you set up your co-op corporation, you use somebody who um, knows what they're doing, um, your attorney, and they write up your bylaws, uh, or in some cases, uh, operating agreement, which is what LLCs have, uh, to allow for patronage dividends. Uh, the IRS says that you are supposed to have that wording in place uh, before you do the patronage dividends. Um, and the, the basic rule is what's in quotations there, uh, business done with the co-op. So in a worker co-op, that's almost always the hours that people put in. Uh, you can use approximations for that. There are certainly co-ops that say, you know, we all work roughly the same amount, so we're just gonna consider everybody to, to be equal in our allocation or people work full-time or they work half-time and so they get a full allocation or a half allocation. You can definitely do that. Um, as an approximation of how much people work. Um, one of the things you can't do that a lot of people would like to do is have a co-op where uh, the members really just invest money and then the co-op turns around and invests in other things. You can't use patronage dividends to allocate based on the amount of somebody's investment. Um, that's an area I've talked to quite a few attorneys and done quite a bit of research on that because a lot of people would really love to do that, um, but you're not allowed to. Um, So the patronage dividend formula needs to reflect how the profits are earned. So it presumably hours worked is, is one good measure of how uh, the profit was earned. Uh, and uh, you can weight that somewhat for seniority. Um, there's not a lot of precedence uh, for that. There were some court cases a long time ago with, from some sawmills in the Northwest, uh, Oregon, I believe it was, uh, where they were trying to weight their amounts that they paid out in patronage dividends. And uh, there was a court case that outlines that and there's really no other guidance than that court case. Um, so you can do some amount of weighting, but, but not a lot and have any, um, any support from a court case or from the IRS. Um, in a different kind of co-op, you would use something different if your worker co-op, if you have a shopper co-op, typically you'd have purchases uh, be your measure for uh, patronage dividends. So you can have all kinds of different measures. Obviously, the amount somebody purchases from their co-op contributes to the profits of that co-op, so it makes sense to, to measure things that way. So I, I like to have an example in here. It's a little bit hard on slides. Um, didn't really want to put in um, algebraic formulas. They don't really fit very well on PowerPoint. Um, but I think it's important to do this because um, you know, until you have some experience, it's easy to go off in the wrong direction with your patronage formula. So I wanted to make sure there was an example, something you could go back to and use, um, and we'll just walk through it uh, briefly here. So uh, Co-op Blue had a taxable income before their patronage dividends of $20,000. Um, and you can ap approximate this, uh, you know, just from what you're keeping in your record keeping system as uh, the profits before you have income taxes applied to it. Uh, so you could look at your statements as you go through the year and say, oh, you know, we have this much profit before tax. Um, you know, that might be roughly what we have as our patronage base. And the default treatment of patronage is based on federal taxable income. Uh, and that takes into account if you have tax depreciation, uh, you, know, you can write things off faster or slower if you actually own equipment. Um, and then this is the taxable income before any loss carryovers. Um, so if you had a loss from a prior year that is carrying into your current year, you can do your patronage before you apply that loss, which um, you know, some, some co-ops like to do and, and some don't. And that's where a little bit of tax planning comes in handy uh, to make sure you understand the situation of your particular co-op. So here's an example of a 
two-member worker co-op. Uh, obviously, most worker co-ops uh, need to have more members than that. Uh, but in this case, there is a work, member A, member B, and then one non-member worker. So member A has 2,000 hours, which is roughly uh, 40 hours a week full-time. The other member, B, works half that. And then there's a non-member who works about half that. So the total number of hours worked is 4,000. So it's important to note you have to include your non-members in that formula. Now, if this non-member was a contractor, uh, you wouldn't really put them in your formula. It's really only the people who are actually working for the business. But in this case, they are working for the business. They're getting a W-2. Um, and presumably someday they will become a member. Uh, so there's a total of 4,000. And then your allocation, and this again gets a little bit busy on a PowerPoint slide, um, but member A worked 2,000 hours, which is half of the hours worked, so they can be allocated half of the profit. Um, 2,000 divided by 4,000 times the $20,000 of profit. And then member B would be allocated half that much because they worked half that much. Now the non-member share would be, again, um, a half share at that $5,000. Most co-ops do not allocate to their non-members, but you are allowed under IRS rules to do that allocation if you choose to. Um, you know, you would generally want to have that in your bylaws, um, but uh, just so that you know that it is something you can do, but it is really hardly ever done. So that $5,000, generally speaking, uh, is going to become the, uh, the profit that stays in the business and builds up the unallocated reserves. So here's the maximum amount you could give, and you can always give less than that if you want to have more go into reserves. So the numbers from the last page, the 10,000 and 5,000 each, so you could do a total patronage dividend of $15,000, and then the 5,000 would go into the reserves. And then you can choose to only allocate a portion of that patronage dividend in cash, and then the rest of it could stay as equity in the co-op. So the IRS says that you have to pay 20% minimum out to your members uh, when you do patronage dividends. So you could uh, be deducting all of this amount, the, the patronage dividends, the 10,000 for member A, the 5,000 for member B, but only give out cash of $3,000, that 20% 2,000 for member A, 1,000 for member B, and the rest could stay in the business to add work and capital. So if your co-op needs more money to fund accounts receivable or buy some equipment or have a marketing campaign or something like that, this is one way to get more investment in the co-op uh, without the co-op paying tax on it. So here's a summary allocated in cash, $3,000, and on through, and then the 5,000 gets kept by the co-op, so, so it shows how much tax they would pay. So the, the co-op would pay $1,500 in tax on the $5,000, so there'd be $3,500 left over to add to the reserves. So that's something that um, you know, builds up a retained amount in case a member leaves. Um, that amount stays there to help fund the co-op. One more thing to remember is that you are supposed to give people notices about the amount of patronage dividends. In a really small co-op, that's pretty easy. You just send out an email and everybody's done. Uh, as you get larger, uh, you would typically want to have a written notice. Uh, and it goes through, you know, what's the authority for the patronage, the bylaws, um, and then the amount that you're giving to that individual worker. And here's a sample of some wording that you could use um, for that notice. You know, again, most small co-ops, you know, everybody sits on the board, so you don't necessarily need to have a formal notice. But it's not a bad idea just to make sure everybody uh, knows exactly uh, what the result of the patronage dividend is. <clears throat> so then we switch over to the partnerships. So can I, can I ask a question or is it not time for questions yet? Oh, you can jump in. I was just curious. So, can you can you explain briefly a little bit if this is helpful for other people too? Like, you talked about uh, for for the for the patronage dividends that um, you pay out, you can either pass on the responsibility for those taxes to be paid by the members, or the co-op can take responsibility for it. 
right? Yeah, um, I mean, the amount that you give out in patronage dividend is what you're shifting the tax responsibility to the, the member for, and what the co-op doesn't uh, allocate in patronage dividends, the co-op pays tax on. Got it, thank you. Sure. I have a question, just a follow up on that. So to make sure I'm clear, so the patronage, um, what shows up on that 1099 PATR is whatever you gave them in cash or a check, plus whatever is allocated to their equity account. Right, so in the case of member A here on the slide, um, they would get a pay 1099 PATR for $10,000, and that's what they would claim on their personal tax return. Okay, making sure, thank you. Oh yeah, no, that, it, it is very confusing. So the next type, oh, sorry, sorry. So they would, they would, you would put 1099 PAT on their 1099 PATR if for member A, you would put $10,000, but isn't the co-op retaining 80% of that? It is, yes. But they have uh, to declare it anyway? Right. Um, yes, that it's a way for, basically you're asking member A and member B to invest more in the co-op when you do this. Um, so it, it's basically a way to build up more equity in the co-op, uh, but that is the rule. One of the reasons that uh, the IRS wants people to give out notices and to have clear bylaws about this is because in the past, people have objected to the fact that their co-op retained a portion of it and they paid tax on all of it. Uh, that was a, that's a, at least in the past, I, I, I suppose it still is, but in the past that was certainly a big issue in agricultural co-ops, which get extremely large. And so the, the farmer isn't really, doesn't feel all that much a part of the co-op and they get this 1099 P PATR and they're like, well, I only got cash for 20% of this, what's going on? So then they object and people have actually gone to court over that and so on. And it has been held, you know, that this is all within the IRS rules and so on. Um, and that's part of where the requirement for notification comes from. That if, uh, if you don't tell people, yeah, we're keeping 80% of this patronage dividend, then you potentially have a, a problem. I mean, it's a member relation problem, but also potentially a tax issue, so. Probably more than you wanted to know. Um, so um, the next thing is the uh, partnerships. And there's a lot of co-ops and I think a growing number. Um, you know, I don't think it's the majority of the co-ops that I, I uh, run into and work with, but there are more and more that are taxed as partnerships. Uh, partnerships are nice because it's a less formal entity than a corporation. Uh, there is not really the separation. A corporation, um, as, as we all know, for better or worse, is considered to be a person. A partnership is, is not. Uh, and so a, a partnership is really all of the individuals together and that's how the taxation works is that everything gets allocated to all the individuals and nothing stays in the partnership. So the, the basic rules on a partnership, if you have one, is that the return is due sooner. So it's two and a half months after year end, March, March 15th. And make sure that's not showing up on my screen. Um, you can extend it for six more months um, and you have to be calendar year. That's to sync up between the partnership and your personal 1040, uh, that those two years are the same. Um, and you definitely need to file the first year you are formed uh, because that next a bullet point, there is a significant late penalty if you don't file. Um, it's now up to $205 per member per month, uh, up to 12 months late. So. I know I've talked to worker co-ops where they have forgotten to file and it's like, well, you may as well just dissolve and pretend like you never existed because your penalty is going to be so large. Um, but I have seen the IRS assess this penalty and uh, only occasionally uh, uh, you know, rescind it. So uh, you wanna make sure you're paying attention to your deadlines if you are a partnership. Um, so one thing to remember is the IRS does not recognize uh, you as a cooperative. The co-op is really only co-op corporations in the eyes of the IRS. So you really fall under all the other rules that a partnership has. Um, 
And then uh, important to note that the tax is all paid by the individuals or the members, uh, and some members may be other kinds of entities. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, I list out a few places, California, New York, New York City, Portland, where um, members of a partnership uh, and the partnership itself end up, both end up paying taxes. Um, but that's pretty unusual. Most states uh, do not have any tax consequences for a, a partnership except in unusual circumstances that I've never run across in a worker co-op. <clears throat> so uh, again, the reserves uh, do not belong to the partnership. They belong to the partners. Uh, and this is a, one reason that folks move from a partnership to a co-op corporation. Um, you can do that um, pretty much at any time. If you do it at the end of a year, you can file a partnership tax return one year and a co-op corporation return the next year. Um, if you do it mid-year, you'll end up with two tax returns for one year, which generally you know, isn't, isn't what people want to do. Uh, but it is possible to move from a partnership to a corporation. Um, it's not possible to move back the way the rules are written. Um, but you can move if, if you decide to, if you want of reserves uh, or something like that. And then it's important just to the mechanics of a partnership is that there is a Schedule K-1, which is the form that reports to each owner or member what their portion of the partnership's income is. So everybody, uh, well, if the partnership files a tax return, the Form 1065 is the federal and then whatever your state number is. And then it, as one of the schedules to that form 1065 is the K-1, which allocates to everybody. And then a copy of that K-1 goes to each member and then they turn around and use that to report on their personal uh, income tax return uh, form 1040. So that K-1 allocates all of the items uh, of income and it reports the guaranteed payments, which is the salary or wage that somebody might get paid during the course of the year. Um, there are various kinds of income that can get split up within that, things that have different tax treatments. Um, but everything that the 1065 reports, the partnership, gets allocated down to the members. And then uh, accrual or cash basis does not change the allocation to members um, as far as all the income is allocated and taxed to the members in the year it's earned. So if you get a K-1 now from your partnership uh, from the 2020 year, you pay tax on your 2020 1040, the one you're uh, going to be filing coming up here in April uh, or later if you extend it. Um, so that's important to remember there's no deferral. In the co-op corporation, you had that potential for deferral with your patronage dividends. So the, the partnership uh, income, uh, you need to have wording in your operating agreement on how you are allocating that. Uh, traditionally, and if you uh, talk to uh, most whoops, tax preparers, uh, it's based on the percentage of ownership. So somebody owns 35% of the co-op, they get 35% of the profit. And of course, in a worker co-op, you generally want to use hours. And you can write that into your operating agreement operating agreement and do that. And there's no restriction from the IRS on, on how you do that, except that you can't uh, have tax avoidance as your motivation, uh, which would mean, you know, somebody on their personal return, you know, doesn't have much income this year, so you can allocate more to them to avoid more taxes and then allocate less to them the year they have more income from other places. You know, that's not something you can do, but if you have a, a an hours formula set up in advance, you can definitely use that to allocate the profits. Um, and one thing uh, also is that all profits have to get allocated this year that way. So if you have non-member uh, non workers, uh, you know, they can't get any allocation from the partnership profits. Um, so you have to think about how that fits in with your co-op. You know, most worker co-ops, you know, that are taxes, um, partnerships, there's five people or eight people, and you know that's all there is. There aren't any non-members um, involved. If you do have non-members, they are potentially employees, and you would have to have W-2s, um, you know, which you don't have for your uh, your members. There's an example here: uh, Co-op Green, 
uh, that has $20,000 of profit. And just to contrast with uh, how the, um, the co-op corporation worked, uh, we have again the three members, the same number of hours worked, um, but the formula works out different because the non-members don't get allocated any of the profit. Uh, so all the profit has to go to the owners. So you would still take their hours and just the hours for the two of them and allocate those out so that you come to 100% allocated to them. Um, and one thing uh, we talked about in the co-op corporation that you only need to give out 20% of the, uh, the allocated patronage dividend to people. In a partnership, you actually don't have to give any of that out in cash. So uh, member A would pay tax on $13,333, but the partnership doesn't have to give them any cash to pay their taxes. Now, obviously, there's two people uh, controlling the co-op. They can make that decision to do so. But in a larger partnership, um, you, know, you, ha you all have to come to agreement on how that works. And the the partnership is not obligated to give you any cash uh, to cover your taxes. So just a, a quick summary of that. Uh, again, any employees are receiving a W-2. The, uh, the worker owners are not receiving a W-2. There's actually a rule that you, you can't pay people with a W-2 when they are partners in a partnership. Uh, so they just get the K-1 reporting that income to them. So. Um, let's see. So there are no retained uh, reserves in a partnership. So this just runs through that. Uh, one method, and uh, I know I first heard this from the ICA group, um, makes a lot of sense, is just to lengthen the amount of time that you would pay people out if they leave your co-op. Uh, you wouldn't want somebody who's built up quite a bit of equity in the co-op to leave and you have an obligation to pay them back immediately when you know, the co-op is going through a, a, a cash crunch period. So you want to make sure there's some discretion to pay it out over time, pay it back sooner if you can. Uh, S-corporations, I'll just cover this for a minute. As I mentioned, the main place I run into S-corporations is through um, uh, entities that are converting and they generally terminate their S-corporation status, which is not hard to do, uh, you, but you have to remember to do it. Um, and then uh, the S corporation, if you decide to keep it, which there are some worker co-ops that do that, uh, you file again, like a partnership within two and a half months of your year end, um, you can extend it. There is also a late penalty in an S corporation. Um, again, the $205 per member per month. So you wanna make sure if you have an S corporation that you stay on top of your, uh, your deadlines, uh, your extension dates and so forth. Um, and as with the partnerships, the the IRS does not recognize these as, as corporations and everything gets passed, excuse me, does not recognize these as cooperatives. Um, so they are all under the S corporation rules. Uh, and again, all profit is allocated and there are, is also a K-1 that's an attachment to the S corporation form, the 1120S. Um, you know, we don't really need to spend any more time on that um, since there are, are so few of those. Um, and like a partnership, people pay tax in the year that, uh, that the profit is earned and they can't defer it into the next year like, they, like you can with uh, patronage dividends uh, in an accrual basis cooperative. <clears throat> One downside of an S corporation as a worker co-op is that, again, you have to allocate everything based on ownership. There, it's very strict in the tax code that you can't use anything other than ownership to allocate your profits. So if you have a non-member uh, non worker, uh, you'd have to figure out some other way to allocate this if people are working more or less than their um, ownership amount. Um, you have to figure out some other way to equalize that if you really want to follow the spirit of the co-op rules of uh, allocating profits based on business done with your co-op. <clears throat> so there are some exempt organizations, primarily those are housing co-ops in my experience, um, or they are associations of co-ops, uh, somebody like a National Cooperative Business Association. Um, they file a whole completely different kind of tax return than 990. 
and the due dates are here, May 15th for a calendar year end, and you can extend it. Um, there are significant penalties again, so if you do have a nonprofit, you want to stay on top of that. Um, and if you don't file for three years, the IRS automatically uh, dissolves your organization. Uh, and then the IRS, again, does not recognize these as co-ops. So mostly they are entities that are low-income housing or senior housing. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you have to fall within certain uh, classes of, of beneficiaries in order to qualify as an exempt organization. And also, unlike a co-op, uh, you can't have um, member equity and you can't allocate your profits. You can't have anybody taking advantage of your uh, tax-exempt organization. And then one thing with exempt organizations, they do have lots of uh, IRS rules to follow that other businesses, corporations, and partnerships do not. So you have to make sure you're on top of all that, um, you know, and have a good attorney help you get that set up. Um, so we don't really need to talk anymore about that because there are so few um, of those. So now uh, we'll talk some about the new tax law, um, which is, uh, of some interest. I think last year I talked about the new tax law, which was the, the one with the qualified business income and so forth, which we'll touch on briefly. Um, but the newest law is the one passed about a month ago. Um, and there's the new, uh, I guess it's also called the, the three martini lunch tax break, uh, where now restaurant meals will be 100% deductible in 2021. And I'm sure we will all hopefully be very happy to go out to restaurants and they'll be happy to have us. So I guess this is a little incentive for you to go spend money at a restaurant and have your co-op pay for it. Um, <clears throat> the main thing that people have had questions about is the, the PPP loans. Um, right now people are, have either uh, gone through or are about to go through the loan forgiveness. Um, so there are lots of details on that. Um, I guess the one thing I'll mention for co-ops is that if you have 20 uh, or fewer than 20 owners, you uh, do treat everybody as an owner and not as an employee for the forgiveness calculation. Um, and there, there are, other than that, just a ton of little uh, nuances and details. Uh, many co-ops will have had a PPP loan small enough that they can get automatic forgiveness. Um, so you want to check out those rules. Um, one thing, and I put this on the, the page here, uh, that new law that passed at the end of December allows uh, the expenses related to a PPP loan to be deducted while the forgiveness itself will be tax exempt. Um, states may or may not follow that. So we were all concerned before that tax law passed a month ago that the IRS would basically be taxing PPP loan forgiveness. And that, that's what they were going to do until Congress changed the rule. But now states have to adopt that change. Some states automatically adopt that change, others do not. So you do have to pay attention to the state you're in. If it has income taxes, uh, you may have a difference between federal and state treatment. And then there's the employee retention credit, uh, which prior to the tax bill a month ago was not allowed if you took a PPP loan. So it was something that people didn't look at very closely previously. But now it is allowed retroactively back into 2020. Uh, but you had to have had uh, your gross revenue go down by 50% or more. So basically, you had to be shut down at some point in 2020 uh, that your uh, revenue fell that much. So I'm not going to go into those details. Not very many worker co-ops that I've run into had that issue. Um, you know, fortunately, they had other streams of income or, uh, you know, we're not directly affected. Um, but that's something to keep in mind. You can get a PPP loan and still qualify for the gross receipts test. Now there is another uh, exception in the, uh, the gross to the gross receipts test to allow you to qualify for the employee retention credit that is um, more allowable, but still um, you had to have fully or partially suspended operations in any quarter of 2020 due to a government order. So if you were running a restaurant, a juice bar, a coffee shop, and the local government said you can no longer have people in your space and you can only do curbside pickup, 
then you potentially can still qualify even if your sales didn't go down 50%. So you need to take a look at that. Um, there are a few uh, details in this rule that you have to take a look at, um, but it is something to think about. You know, if you have a tech co-op of five people that all work from, uh, you know, their homes, then obviously this didn't, you know, this is not a rule that applies to you. But if you have any kind of a public facing business where people come into a place of business and it got closed, you might qualify for it even if your sales didn't go down 50%. So you want to take a look at that. Um, this credit is paid, uh, is refunded out of payroll taxes you would otherwise owe. Um, and then it's claimed on your quarterly tax filing, the form 941. So your uh, payroll tax provider, or your, excuse me, your, your payroll provider, whoever that is, Gusto or ADP or Paychex or whoever, um, should have an entry screen uh, for your payroll where you can enter in the amount of qualifying uh, wages. Um, we have a, a whole series of free webinars on our website. There's a link here, uh, Wagner CPA's resources. Um, there was one given about two weeks ago uh, that has the details on that. Uh, and there are links to, to more details in that talk. Um, so if you think you might qualify for any of this, you want to want to take a look at that. Although I have been amazed talking to my clients, how many people you know did not have that problem, even people you would expect to have had it. Um, you know, there was public support or they figured out some other way to operate their business that everything worked out. So, um, so that's great. If you didn't have a problem, then you, know, you don't need to pay so much attention to these uh, programs. Now the PPPs uh, loans are now uh, extended. So you could go back if you didn't have one previously, you can get a first time one. And if you uh, did have one previously, you can get a second time uh, loan. Uh, the the uh, restrictions are, are stricter now than they were. Um, you need to have a specific 25% uh, reduction in your gross receipts. Um, and so the previous, the first round of PPP, it was really just that you had uncertainty um, and then uh, for this one, you actually have to have had a fall off in funds. So um, you know, if you did have a, a, a significant reduction, um, then uh, you, know, you may qualify for the second round. And again, we had a separate um, webinar, free webinar on that. So you can go uh, gather a little bit more information on that if, if you, uh, uh, you know, haven't already taken a look. So I, I am not the expert on PPP and ERC, uh, the employee retention credit, but if, if anybody has any questions, I certainly could uh, try and answer those. Otherwise, we will launch into how to report your personal taxes. Bruce, there are a few questions in the chat from earlier parts of the presentation. Um, okay. I see someone said, uh, would it, um, there's some questions. Someone said, would it follow then that when you are eventually paid patronage that has been retained, you don't pay taxes on it? Yes, that's correct. It's as if you uh, invested more money in the co-op and they're just returning money that uh, is yours back to you. So there is no tax when you get that retained paid out. And then um, another question was, if all employees are co-op members, is there a recommended formula to set aside or reserve from profit? before allocating the patronage? Does this need to be in the bylaws or can it be decided every year by the board? Um, yeah, your bylaws would specify that. Um, in some co-ops that it's required to pay out 100%, um, I generally recommend people leave themselves discretion. Um, you know, if you have a really small profit one year or you're saving up for a particular purpose, um, uh, you know, you like to have the discretion to do that. So the IRS allows you discretion to say, well, we generally will pay patronage dividends, but uh, the board can decide that they want to set aside money for reserves or something else. So um, it depends on what your bylaws say. And my recommendation is to allow yourself uh, the discretion to decide to do patronage dividends or not. I think that was it from the chat so far. Folks can continue to pop stuff in there and I'll jump in with it. 
or anybody can jump in. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a follow up question to that first one. Um, if something that's come up in our co-op is whether it's allowed, uh, whether the co-op is allowed to pay interest on the patronage that is retained by the co-op and if that is allowed, would co-op members then have to pay income tax on the amount of interest that their patronage accrued while it was retained by the co-op? Yes. Yeah, yes, the co-op can pay um, uh, on that. And because it's considered to be equity, technically it's dividends and not interest, uh, but the co-op can do that. You would, again, you'd wanna specify that in your bylaws. And, um, and yes, then the members would pay tax on those dividends. Uh, so you would issue them a 1099 DIV uh, for the amount that you did that, but you certainly could do that if you want to. There are a few co-ops that do that, not, not many, but a few do. I wanted to know if you have to um, claim stipends on your taxes for work that was completed. Um, well, it depends on the source of the stipend. If it's related to a university, you might or might not. But um, generally speaking, if you're getting paid for work done, then, uh, then yes. And that's generally would be reported on a 1099. Uh, this year, they're 1099 NEC, non-employee non compensation. Um, but yes, that would uh, generally be taxable. Okay, it was a stipend from National Expungement Week. It's like a nonprofit organization that does work around criminal justice reform. And would it be filed on the, if it was, the check was made out to the co-op, would the co-op file it on their taxes or the individual person that had completed the work would file, that file it on their individual taxes? Yeah, if the check was made out to the co-op, the co-op would claim it as revenue and then Presumably, the co-op turned around and uh, paid the amount to the individual, and then whatever that person's relationship is to the co-op, you know, the co-op would do a reporting form, a W-2 or a 1099 or, or something like that. Okay, and so then that's something we would file our taxes for, right? Because we um, formed in 2019, um, and the work was completed in 2019, but the check wasn't issued until 2020. So would that be something that's filed for 2021, for our taxes for 2020 and 2021? Yes. Um, you know, assuming you didn't record it as 2019 income, which it sounds like you didn't. Um, so it would then be 2020 income and uh, income to the co-op. And then if the co-op turned around and wrote the check or paid the amount in 2020, then it would also be reporting to that individual uh, on some sort of 2020 form. Assuming the amount was, uh, you know, if it was uh, as an independent contractor, then it would be only for amounts of $600 or more are required to have a 1099. Okay, good. and for the partnership is basically an LLC, correct? Uh, yes, most partnerships now are formed as, are formed as LLCs. So um, you had mentioned that um, co-ops that had gained no revenue would not have to file taxes until they did. Is that also true for partnerships at LLC or do they have to file taxes regardless of whether they generated any revenue? Um, well, as I, I mentioned, it gets a little tricky because there's a pretty big penalty for not filing. So um, yeah, the IRS would say that if you don't have any economic, economic activity, you don't have to file um <clears throat> uh immediately after your startup um, but a lot of states would want you to file so it, it depends um but generally i would say the safest thing to do is definitely to file a tax return and it might have zeros on it um, just to make sure you don't uh, end up with any penalties okay great um we did we decided not to file taxes for 2020 because we had not um, gained any revenue in 2020 um, but I know that there had been some extensions um, to filing taxes. Would you recommend us try to file taxes for 2020? Or I mean, um, I don't wanna ask that, but um, should we reach out to like an insurance person? Are you like off the call to find out if we should file taxes for 2020 as an extension or? 
Well, if you file a tax return for 2019, you really need to file for 2020. If you've never filed at all and you had no economic activity, um, you know, I think you probably would come under an exception. Um, but it depends. I mean, if you if if that stipend question was also about this co-op, there was economic economic activity at least uh, as far as receiving and paying out that check. Um, so, you know, th there are some gray areas where it, it's hard to say if, you know, if you really have to do something or not, but it would certainly be safer to file. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. So we're um, at close to an hour. We'll definitely be ending up here um, at half past. Um, and I don't have that much material left. Um, so there's certainly room for questions if people have them. So uh, income taxes for you as an individual. Um, if you receive a 1099 PATR um, or you get a K-1 from, from your partnership or S corporation, um, it's just important to remember that, uh, that as a co-op member, you are a business owner and your taxes can be a little more complicated than you might have expected. Uh, you know, you might have to do quarterly estimated taxes or something like that. Um, so we have a, a few articles on our website primarily aimed at uh, co-op corporations and people receiving patronage dividends uh, because that is a, um, a little bit of a, a unclear area in the law. Um, I've talked to a number of other accountants and attorneys and we feel pretty good about uh, this advice. Um, you know, and generally speaking, we have uh, been successful with the IRS, um, but it's not as clear cut as getting a W-2. Uh, so just need to be aware of that. So the 1099 PATR is, uh, as I mentioned, not common and uh, software uh, for doing your 1040 may or may not easily accommodate it. Um, one thing to remember, and I won't get into the, the details, this is the previous new tax law from a couple of years ago now, um, there is now a qualified business uh, income deduction for uh, people who own businesses. Uh, and so now as a, a worker co-op member, that is you. And so you potentially have this tax break um, where you wouldn't pay income tax on 20% of the profits. And the 1099 PATR actually qualifies for that. Um, there are various reasons you might or might not actually qualify uh, based on income limitations uh, and related to that certain kinds of um, businesses wouldn't qualify. Um, but generally speaking, uh, this is actually another uh, item in favor of, uh, of worker co-ops. Uh, although the profit allocation of a partnership and the profit allocation of an S corporation also fit within this, uh, this QBI um, uh, deduction. And then probably the most, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd say, it's not exactly controversial, but unclear area of the tax code for patronage dividends is whether they are subject to SC, which I should have spelled that out. SC is self-employment tax. So that's what applies if you have, uh, for instance, a Schedule C, or if you are a partner in a, um, a partnership, an LLC, uh, whatever uh, profits are allocated to you are definitely subject to the self-employment tax if you're a partner in a partnership. Um, on the other hand, if you're uh, an owner of an S corporation, the profit allocation is definitely not subject to self-employment tax. <clears throat> That's one reason that accountants often steer people to S corporations is because they can get some of their profits at a lower tax rate. But generally speaking in a worker co-op, uh, your 1099 PATR will not be subject to self-employment tax. Um, again, um, there is a, an in-depth uh, exploration of the uh, tax law behind that. Uh, an attorney, uh, Gregory Wilson, uh, has an article up there if you really want to get into the details. It's not that technical, but it does go on at length uh, about why a patronage dividend should not be subject to that. 
And then once you know all that, there's a question about how do you actually report it on your return. This is actually the sticking point. Um, a couple of years ago when this qualified business income rule came in, it changed uh, one, of, one of the, well, the ways that different accountants were reporting the patronage dividend income uh, because you wanted to capture that additional uh, qualified business income tax break. And the tax software uh, is not really, um, doesn't take into account co-ops. So it was a little hard to fit things together. So I have an article, which there'll be a link here a little bit later, again, on our uh, co-op blog. Um, and this gives a reasonably detailed description here in the PowerPoint. Somebody who was an experienced tax preparer could probably look at this and figure out what to do. Uh, basically, you just report the 1099 PATR um, as other income, as your option one, and that would not trigger the self-employment tax. Um, there's another form here where you can, can uh, uh, claim that 20% deduction so that you're not paying income tax on all of it. <clears throat> and then there's another option, which is to file the Schedule C. Um, many people are familiar with this uh, in the, the world of the gig economy. A lot more people are contractors uh, than previously. So you would file a Schedule C or the CEZ, the shorter form. And you would report it there, but then you don't want it to be subject to self-employment tax. And that's uh, where um, one of the difficulties comes in because most uh, commercially available software for individuals doesn't have the option, or you have to figure out a workaround. Um, and so there is a workaround uh, that you can use on this. Um, so you can specify that the CEZ is not subject to SE tax, again, that option is often not available. Um, or you can go in and put in a negative number for the amount on the schedule SE, which is where that tax is calculated, uh, resulting in uh, zero income. Uh, so you don't just have to see when you go to prepare your return. Um, again, most uh, folks who are in worker co-ops do not have especially complicated ta taxes, and this might be the hardest thing for them to deal with. So I'd be kind of ashamed to have to go pay a tax preparer uh, multiple hundreds of dollars to file your return uh, you know, when TurboTax can do it, although it can take a little bit of effort to figure it out. Um, nice thing with the Schedule CEZ is that it automatically flows to this tax break with the qualified business income. So, um, this just reiterates some of those problems that I mentioned that you might uh, run into. Uh, so stick with it. Uh, there are certainly people out there, there's some resources on the Federation of Worker Co-ops website about this. Um, and then the main thing we wanted to say, this happened uh, more than a few times, uh, especially the first year that the qualified business income came in, uh, that people got notices from the IRS saying they asking them why they didn't pay the self-employment tax. And so there's actually a little section on the Federation's website uh, where there's a response letter and a number of us work together on, on that. And everybody we know who followed those recommendations had the IRS uh, back off and uh, they were not assessed any additional taxes or penalties. They basically just had uh, to deal with the IRS, which Nobody, even CPAs, doesn't like dealing with the IRS. So you just have to kind of grin and bear it. Um, and here's the, the um, uh, one of the links uh, to an article on our website that goes through this in a little bit more detail. Um, so if your uh, LLC tax is a partnership, it should be pretty easy. A K-1 is a pretty common form. Um, I have had people in uh, partnership worker co-ops that had problems finding somebody to prepare their return, which really surprised me, whoops, um, because it is such a common form. Um, you should be able to just plug it into your TurboTax or whatever and, um, and go. You will be subject to the self-employment tax. Um, so that can make the total taxes uh, on your income to be 40% or more of your income, depending on what state you're in. You get 15% for your self-employment tax. Your federal income tax might be, um, you know, 10, 12, 15, or even 22 or 25%, depending. Um, 
And so it can easily add up to be 40%. So you need to be prepared for that shock because there's no withholding in a partnership. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, in, in an S corporation, it's very similar to a partnership in that there is a K-1 and you report income from that. But the bulk of your earnings in an S corporation are typically reported on a W-2, so there's already withholding. Um, so generally, an S corporation is relatively easy to report on your personal tax return. And then that's really it. Um, you know, we have uh, a num uh, maybe 20 or 25 minutes left. If anybody has any questions, uh, certainly happy to go through those. It's, your chance to ask the accountant. And, uh, and uh, my contact info is in here. Um, so yeah, whoever wants to, to jump in. All right, and if, if there isn't anything, I guess everybody gets to get out of class early, uh, but I'm happy to stick around for the, the rest of the time. And here's some upcoming things for the Federation. Uh, you know, ho hopefully everybody here is a member uh, or uh, are considering uh, becoming a member because it's obviously a really great resource for everybody. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, so there are a few upcoming events that you can find on the Federation's website. So I realized that this slide is in Spanish, so I'm just gonna say them real quick. <laughs> Um, you can go to the to usworker.coop slash calendar um, and tomorrow we have a similar webinar in Spanish um, on tax prep and uh, on the 5th, February 5th, we have a webinar, a startup webinar for co-op starting up and uh, then on the 1st we have um, co-op clinic office hours for the PPP loan. So you're welcome to join that as well. Um, and if you want to stay connected to the Federation, if you're already, if you're not already, um, you can go to the to usworker.coop. And if you want to explore membership slash join, um, and if this was helpful to you, please consider becoming a sustainer at usworker.coop slash sustainer. Um, and I put it in the chat, but uh, Co-op Clinic is a series that provides technical assistance and support. Um, and you can also find that more information on that on the website. And there's going to be a lot more um, of these webinars coming up through the year, throughout the year. So, thank you all. Um, we will send a follow up, um, like I said on the chat, with a recording of the presentation as well as the slides. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. This was super helpful. Okay, well, I'm going to jump off. Thanks a lot, Sheila. Bye. Thank you, Bruce. Bye, everybody. I think I just let someone in. Gary, I think you just joined the um, webinar just ended. Um, but we will be sending out a recording to yes, everyone who registered. That. Sorry about that. I, I, was, I was part of it on my phone and then I finally oh. got home and just checked back in. Oh, great. Okay, okay. At least okay. you caught it. That's great. I just wanted to make sure you weren't a new guest. Yeah, no, thank you so much. All right, take care.